they can now hear us. All right. But they can't see us. Welcome to Forged at the Table. My name is Charles. I'm your dungeon master, and these fine folks are your players. And of course, as always, you're the important part. You're our viewers. Today we're going to be doing a little bit of Adventure Weekly, our Sunday afternoon evening game, depending on where you live. And this week we have a special new feature. I called around, I called Amazon, I called Barnes & Noble. I got a hold of the old owners of Hastings Books and Video. And I managed to find an old storehouse, a warehouse out in the suburbs of Chicago. Frozen solid from this past winter, a crate marked Mad Clergy. And we were able to get our very own Mad Clergy for all future games of Adventure Weekly. So there he is on the bottom side of your screen. He is the newest member of Adventure Weekly and the final member of Adventure Weekly. We will not be adding any more spots. For those of you who tuned in yesterday morning for the one hour and 26 minutes of absolutely fun, glorious role playing that was A Walk Beyond, where we had all kinds of audio problems, guess what? I believe those audio problems are solved. It was not a ban apparent bandwidth issue. It was an apparent software issue with voice meter banana that I use to monitor and run all my audio on this particular computer because this morning everybody started going robotic on us and I did a little research and came up and found out that, hey, look, it's, it's, it's definitely voice meter. So hopefully that's solved. That means that we can continue forward with all the streams, which includes very possibly not this coming Saturday, but the Saturday after, which looks like April 7th. We're working on getting the band back together again for the second episode of A Walk Beyond, where I run a game, a campaign for five of the fabulous moderators over at D&D Beyond. Um, so we'll be able to kick the tires on that, get that running again. A um, couple announcements. There will be uh, DM's designs tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern. This designs is going to be the last Monday edition of DM's design. As next week on April 2nd, it's replaced by Shifting Sands campaign. Um, tomorrow night, I'm going to be talking about... Uh, some of the decisions that were made in some of our past games have actually gotten some, some messages about some decisions I made and the way some of the things were played out and planned out. So I'm going to cover some of that stuff tomorrow night. Um, probably going to be a little bit shorter than usual stream. I'm going to try and cut it at two hours. Tuesday night, um, we have the regular DM's design. That DM's design is going to be specifically talking about two things. One is map making and creating and the various programs that are out there for you to do that with. As well as we're going to be talking about NPC creation and how that can play a role and affect your adventure design. So those are two topics for my night. Wednesday night, we have nothing. This is actually a Wednesday off. How about that? And then on Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time, I know it's running up against Critical Role. Please don't send me any more messages. I know that Stump's game is going against the mighty CR. You know what? Somebody has to do it. No. So stump a matic stepping forward on th this Thursday, the 29th at 9 or 8 p.m. Eastern with the one shot. This is going to be his test run. We're hoping to add him in as our second dungeon master. Um, so if that works out, we're going to have two DMs here. I'm working on a third and a fourth right behind that. So hopefully we'll get a bunch of games up and running for you guys. Um, the rest of the week schedule is down below. You can also wait till we go offline because I, the new pop-up screen, the offline screen has our exact schedule and all of that. Um, if you have a desire to, to jump in on some games here, that information is down below. It's even simpler than it was before. All you need to do is drop a follow on us here on the channel and get involved on our Discord and possibly even our Twitter. That is the easiest way to do it. I'd like to give a shout out to MMO Maniac XXX 
for the follow while we're offline. We've had 300 plus channel views since yesterday's insanity of, of a walk beyond. Um, so if you ever want to get involved in some games, let us know. We're definitely here to run games for you. That's the whole premise of the show, the whole premise of this whole thing. Um, so now let's go around the horn. Let's hear from the players, who they are, who they're playing, and anything else they want to bomb out there. We're going to start with Jeannie. Hi, I'm Jeannie. Um, if you don't know already, Charles is my husband. I'm going to be playing Sirith, and she is a paladin. Jens. Hello. My name is Jens, and I, I don't know. I just do stuff. And <laughs> um, I'm playing a, a, a Leandra Nightfall. A rogue, a little shit dealer. Small little blonde girl rogue. <laughs> That's it. And Connor. I'm Connor. Uh, I'm going to be playing Full Rig Frostbeard, uh, a dwarven ranger. Since sadly, Killer Ash Redfist was devoured by a mimic last week. Yeah. And of course, last but certainly not least, Mad Clergy. Hey everybody, uh, Mad Clergy here. I'm going to be playing Uriel. Um, he is a um, Asimar uh, sorcerer, divine soul. Uh, me and um, Frostbeard have been traveling for a minute, so we'll be good buddies. I like other people. That's my, my character's main concept. He, he likes other people a lot. Good, good. Yeah, I just turned her up there, Firehawk. Jens, you want to go ahead and talk for me so I can get another feed on your... Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. That's better. Better? Yeah, okay. I turned her up. And folks, you will see up in the corner before we get this thing going, there is a new donations goal. It's got 173 days to go, and it's all for sending some of us, Forge at the Table, to TwitchCon this year. Why? Well, because we want to go to TwitchCon. So it's there. <laughs> give, don't give. Yeah, it's up to you. I was I did that on on behest of somebody that wanted us to do it so I don't know maybe we maybe we got a secret sugar daddy out there that, that wants to drop some big big moolah on us. So we open this week's episode of Adventure Weekly zooming in from the night sky down through the stone of the mountain into a long lost dwarven chamber. Where we find Leandra Nightfall and Sirith Thran, both exhausted, bones and muscles aching from a hard-fought battle with a shifting creature that took the life of their friend, the bard, the half-orc bard Kilaresh. Both Leandra and Sirith are sitting in the dust a few inches thick, kind of in a daze of sorts, trying to regain their energy and their strength their bodies splattered with red and muck from both the creature and the damage that it inflicted upon the half-orc bard. In front of them sits his torn, thrashed, broken body, a pool of blood drying and mixing into an almost crimsonish, greenish, murky kind of a cement in a way of, of the dust. The creature lays kind of flat, spread out on the ground, and just behind it is the chest that apparently lured the bard to make contact with what we now know to be a mimic. A hideous creature able to change its body and proportions to match that of, a, of an inanimate object to lure its prey. The lid torn off, stacked to the side. You remember seeing inside, mixed in with the dust, a very long, just about three foot long um, box, kind of slender in build. Another shorter, smaller uh, box. And then a small leather pouch that was well worn and has seen more than a few, probably centuries, 
by the looks of this place. Again, the room is covered with broken benches. It was obviously a feast hall at some point in time, an immaculate carving the length of the hall's curved roof, depicting mountains rising up and exposed to the night sky. The two of you are alone. The last thing that you saw other than Killer Ash and the Mimic was the ghostly figures of five miners exiting from one of the rooms off to the side, wandering back out to where the mine tracks and apparent mines were at. What are the two of you going to do? Well, I just can't believe Killer Rush is gone. I know. I think we should just probably get out of here. I wish there was some way that we could bury him, but I don't I don't see anything around here. So I don't remember seeing anything around here that I could cover him with or put him in a place where the rats aren't gonna get him. It just seems horrible. Well, I mean we could look around. There were some other rooms up to the side. It's up to you, you. You knew him well. I did not know him well. So, if you um, don't mind, I would appreciate at least attempting to. I mean, yeah, we've sure. been traveling together for months. We've become good friends. I'd kind of like to find a, a way to at least get him up and away from the rats or critters that might chew on him. I have no problem with that. I, I didn't know him well, but you know, I did admire his spunk, you know. <laughs> so, let's. Let's do it. Let's let's look around then for a little bit. Maybe we'll we'll find something okay. where we could maybe even a little uh, cubby hole. We could stash them away and then cover them up. Even some. I mean, this is a place of stone. Even if there's a like a stone place, you know, cabinet, something that seal him off away from everything. Yeah, sounds that good. would be cool. Let's look then. Okay. So you're going to begin kind of looking around to see if, if, if you can find some sort of object to, to stash Killer Rush's body away? Yeah. Okay, are you going to reserve your, your okay? Well, anyways, you, you begin to, to, to drag your feet kind of slowly and mournfully through the dust, um, looking around, going from room to room, and you go through about three or four rooms. You come across the room where the rat's rat, and you see a few long, um, disused, uh, crates. Um, they look to be of some kind of a wood, but strangely they haven't um, at this point succumbed to the ravages of time. Um, there is quite a bit of uh, dust and such on top of them, and you can see several like little bit of pattering feet marks or foot marks or tracks through the dust, apparently coming from, from the rats that, that initially had come out and tried to feast upon Killer Ash's broken and torn body. Um, none of them, though, I mean, unless you fold him up, which is, is, is definitely an option considering that a good 70% of his midsection was, was torn away by the mimic. It, it does seem like a viable option that you could maybe fold him up and stuff him inside of one of them. But upon pondering this, it seems that that may not be quite the, the best, I guess, way to go about it. You continue your search on going through each of the rooms one by one. Um, this entire left side of the hallway, you check all five of the rooms, and they all look to have been, for the most part, storage. You find old, uh, broken-down uh, mining picks, shovels, a few mining helmets with, with broken or bent or... or, or, or otherwise unusable uh, mining lights you find boots you find leather aprons all forms of tools throughout these rooms and as you come across the other side 
and and pass by the initial doors that you the initial way that you entered into the place from the mines and begin to search the other rooms those rooms begin to look more like their barracks you begin to see kind of stone coffins if anybody's familiar with like jailhouse scenes or that sort of thing where they'll actually make the beds out of stone and put mattresses over the top of that that's what you kind of find you find no mattresses no real cloth or anything like that probably due to the ravages of time and you find that most of the stone beds are indeed also suffering from from the ravages of time whether it's it's other explorers or, or beasts and creatures, or just the, 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 the fact of time, some of the stone has crumbled away. As you make your way around and eventually come to the room where the five ghostly miners exited out, as you, you kind of turn to come into that room, go ahead and roll me a perception check from both of you. Oh boy, okay. Let's see if Jens can roll higher than a seven. Nope, she's got to keep the curse. And nope, but this Just. character, at least I don't have a negative on it. <laughs> so with my plus, it's an eight. Okay. Sirith, how much? Multiplied. 14. 14. Sirith, kind of with, with Leandra kind of moving just in front of you, um, as you guys came out of the other room and, and turned the corner to go towards this, the, the, the middle of the five rooms on this side where you saw the ghostly apparitions, Leandra actually kind of steps in front of you just about. And as you turn the corner, you notice that this room is, is darker than the other rooms that you've been in. They're, they're dark regardless because th there is no lighting outside of, of the main hall that you're in where those, those sconces lit up on the wall. But none of that light appears to be filtering in to this particular room. This room seems to be exceedingly darker than any of the others. And you notice that Leandra appears to be completely unaware of any change and goes to step past you and into the room. Hold up a second, Lee. Okay. So. Your your senses when when you kind of tell her to, to hold up, you you notice your voice when it when it carries forward. There seems to be a faint and dis, distant like an echo, like a callback of your voice, coming from someplace deep and 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 far off. You can feel a cold, cool air, not a breeze. But right at the entrance, you can see, feel and sense this cold, cool breeze just kind of hanging in the air. You hear a few pebbles like coming down the side of a cliff. And then a, a, a light plonking sound as if something hitting water. And this is the room where the uh, ghostly doors Yeah, this is, this is the, the room where the ghostly miners came out of. Okay. I'm going to use divine sense in looking into that room and see if i don't know maybe it's cursed whatever but trying to figure out why it's so strange leandra you notice sirith kind of stand there and the strange calm kind of comes over her as she kind of takes the flat of her hands pushes them out in front of her and begins to take some some fairly slow and deep breaths her chest kind of expanding and collapsing Sirith, as you kind of reach out with your senses, looking for signs of cursing, signs of, of, of evil, um, things of detriment, and, and, and that sort of thing, you get to the very edge of, of, of your reach, and, and nothing comes back. No curses, nothing like that. And you're just about to pull your senses back in towards you and, and beyond your senses, further out. And strangely enough, what should be beyond your sensing, a, a, a gold, soft gold light. And, and you're kind of seeing this all in your head, but this soft gold light appears, kind of pulses a couple times, and in your mind's eye, you see this emitting from an archway that, that looks quite grand. 
you can see the outlines, not really details, but the outlines of what appear to be two statues standing one to each side. And, and there's a strange warmth to it, like a, a, a beckoning warmth, a warmth of safety, um, and definitely a strong essence of, of good in nature on it. But it's beyond your reach. Like as far as it seems very odd, comes back and you kind of pull yourself back finally. And and that kind of rattles around like a stone in an empty cup in the back of your head. And 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 it holds on for long enough to, to, to almost become oddly annoying. Because you shouldn't have been able to detect that. But it, it, it it's almost as if it made its presence known to you. Okay. And I'm kind of like, what's going on? What I was happened? just trying to see if maybe there was something in that room because it's, it's darker than it should be. If you really listen to the sound, it doesn't react like the rest of the rooms. And I was just trying to sense if, you know, there's something maybe malicious or something in the room. It doesn't wonder, appear to be. I mean, I wonder if that's where those ghost things originated. That's what we're looking at, right? Yeah. Where they came from. That's why I wanted to check out that room is to see if maybe yeah. it was... Oh. you know, cursed or if there was something holding them there, you know, keeping do, them. Do you know anything about ghosts? I know nothing about ghosts. <laughs> I haven't had a whole lot of contact with them so far, but. Uh... You, you, you would have, Sirith, you, you would have learned in, in your training um, at, at the Abbey or Monastery um, where, where you first kind of dedicated yourself um, to the path that you that you wander, you would have learned enough about like the undead, ghosts, and 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 things of restless nature, whether they were evil or not, and and the fact of of you would have also learned about impressions, like of a, a, a like what happens when there's a great catastrophe and people die in that catastrophe and how it creates from the energy it creates this impression and it's almost like a replay loop on on a video type thing um you would have learned that but we're going to cut away from you two to throw gig frostbeard and uriel the dwarven ranger and the ismar sorcerer you th you two have been wandering in these dwarven halls and at first this was kind of like a wonderland for the two of you 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 both found interests that, that called out to you, that pulled you ever deeper in. About a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago, when the last of your rations ran out and you begin to forage, or had to begin to forage off of, of cave mosses and, and these fat rat-like creatures that you found throughout uh, the ruins, that, that enjoyment began to wane. Um, your, your, your spirits, while not crashing down and depression setting in, you, you definitely began to wonder if you were ever going to find your way out of this place. A few moments ago, you entered in to, to a very large cavern coming out of, of a ruined hall. And you can tell or could tell immediately that there was... A, a, a collapse of some kind and and it and it you would you would read tales back at the university before you guys were, were sent here um to investigate the rumors of this place of of dwarven miners chasing rare metals and gems getting a bit overzealous and causing huge catastrophes sometimes where entire sections of the mine would collapse wreaking havoc not only on the mines and the halls immediate but a lot of times to the dwarven settlements and cities that rested above them. And this cavern stretches far off. Your, your, your torches that you, 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 you had, your oil for any lamps having ran out weeks ago, you've been able to find and make torches. And this being one of the last three torches that the pair of you have, when you come out into this cavern, there's this great cool air and your torchlight stretches out, and it's almost as if your torch is straining to go further. But just the sheer size of this cavern closes in, 
And it almost, in a strange way, it's almost like it's pressing back against your light. So the light that comes off of your torch forms an almost perfect spherical shape. As I said, the air hangs and there's a moisture. You can hear dripping. You can hear skittering of small creatures and pebbles rolling down some unseen slope out in the darkness. You can see in the torchlight off to your left-hand side, cool, smooth water. Not so much as a ripple. It almost looks like reflective, like a glass surface. The only thing giving away that it might be not glass but water is the occasional small amphibious sightless creature that breaks the surface or slides off the edge and into the pool with a little light thunking sound plopping into the cold water, sending small ripples that quickly kind of evaporate into the surrounding water. As you guys have have moved into the cavern, you guys have kind of been tucking along the right-hand side as there's been part of where the cave-in was at centuries ago from the looks of it. You you found chunks of of like the halls above. You found scattered pieces of statuary and and all of that. Both of you go ahead and roll me a perception check, please. I'm going to give you guys advantage just for the simple fact of, of just the still calmness down here. Starting with Thulrig. Thulrig. 24. Nice. And Uriel? I rolled a, uh, a 19. Okay. Both of you here high above and faintly. You, you can't discern what's being said. But the sound of, of conversation, light and soft, whether intended or from the range away that it is, kind of spills over some unseen cliff high above you and traipses tumbling down the slope, reaching your ears. You can hear out of it the fact that it's, it's feminine in nature and in essence. Um, and you feel for, for just a moment like you're being kind of watched by unseen eyes. Full rig in a, like a low whisper to kind of keep his voice down. Yoriel, do you hear that? The voices? I do. It's, it's, it's interesting. They sound feminine. Yeah, what kind of women would be down here? <clears throat> well, I, I imagine the, the the kind of women that would uh, would maybe have extra food or or water that uh, instead of rats, maybe. I cook those rats spectacularly. Thank you very much. I would like no, to no, no, please, please, please. I I know, I know, I know. Absolutely, no. They were fantastic, but uh, but uh, my stomach is uh, is 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 upset and seeking something other than rat. How have you survived this long without me? Can I make out what um, language they're speaking, or is it just the cadence and just just the cadence and and like there's lost notes. Like you you get the definite feeling that if you were just but 25, 30 feet higher, you would begin to maybe even understand what they're saying. But that last 25, 30 feet, all you're getting off of it is the cadence and the softness of the tone that is definitely not female. Sirith and Leandra, as you're standing up there on, on the outskirts of this room looking in and feeling that kind of cool air, it, it definitely begins to take on a bit of, of moisture. There's not like moistness in the air, but it's definitely something from, from earlier times in your lives where, where you were by a cool springtime babbling brook or, or fishing with a relative, that coolness that comes off of water. And, and in that darkness, in that quiet, there's, there's a bit of a tremble. Go ahead and roll me one more perception check, please. Oh, there's the sun again, which makes it a 10. Sirith. 15. Sirith, you just having had pulled your, your, your senses back, um, more from this, this odd glowing like gold light 
and 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 the the statuary and this this kind of yawning entrance um, carved in in an immaculate archway. You pulled back from that, and and you almost feel like maybe you pulled back too soon. So you let your senses open just a little bit more. Not sure what it is you're searching for. It's almost as if some kind of unseen, like, like finger kind of just wagged in front of you to pull you full, f- fuller out. As you kind of extend back out, your ears pick up a, 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 a definite deep, um, as far as tone, uh, vocal, like chattering, like some kind of a conversation. And, and it rises up from inside this room, strangely enough. It rises up out of the darkness and comes just to the very, very front edge of your senses before it fades away. But it definitely reminds you of like two men back in in the abbey or the monastery where you studied for a brief time discussing something. And and the cadence and, and the excitement level just at the very edge of one of them reminds you of two of the monks talking about dinner about food and how there was this this excitement um be because brother malsus one of one of the monks who who's renowned for cooking made these meat pies that everybody thoroughly enjoyed and and it reminds you of that level of excitement like you these monks were standing at this doorway and it was unbeknownst to them that that was what was on the the menu tonight and they, they had just discovered it. That kind of a tone drifts up from the room and out of the room. And you definitely get the feeling that it's definitely drifting upwards, not coming from in front of you. So whispering, because Lee should be right next to me. No, okay, yeah, okay, go ahead, sorry. Kind of nudge her and be like, I think there's somebody down here with us. Oh, I, I didn't... I didn't, I didn't hear anything. What, what was it? Just listen for a little Try bit. You might hear it. So, once again, Th- Thorig and Uriel, you hear, this time definitely feminine, but, but a little bit lighter. It, it barely makes it down to your ears. And, and you can get the definite... Uh, like desire of the tone, like it hushes down, like intentionally trying to to quiet itself as it comes over the edge and down to your ears. You can't make out what they're saying, but there's a strange recognition in the tone. Like whether they have recognized that you're down here, maybe they heard you or are aware of you, that kind of a, of a, of a quieting of the tone. I usually swat Uriel on the arm. Keep your voice down, man. <clears throat> and I'm going to start sneaking forward, trying to get closer to the voice to see if I can't figure out exactly what's making this noise. Okay, roll me a stealth. Uh, 14. Okay. How far into this room would this area be? What do you mean? Because I've got dark vision up to 60 feet, and I'm trying to see if... You, your dark vision goes something. out, and, and you expect to like see the outline. You, you expect to see the outline of a room, because that would be exposed to, to, to your dark vision. And your dark vision traipses out, and, and, and you see the floor, and then blackness. There, there's no walls... There's no back wall, and then, like I said, the floor just kind of goes... And, and, and drops. And you can't see any pattern to the end of the floor. It, it, from where you're at, and, and because of your height and the distance, it looks like literally the wall, it just ends in darkness. Now, whether that was some kind of whatever, like maybe it was meant to be that way, or it just, it looks extremely and exceedingly odd. Back Can I do th- an arcana check to see if maybe I understand what that might be? Like, Yeah, go ahead. Going back over to Thorig and Uriel. 
<clears throat> well, uh, while Thorgood Rig is uh, is going into the room or stealthing into the room, um, Yuri has an idea, and he he digs around in his pack and pulls out a, a python, and uh, on the stone wall, um, he just taps it and and just does a. Okay, L- let me further explain this. He's not going. Th- Thorig's not going in into a room. You guys are literally hearing this coming from dropping from from very high above you. You've been tracking along basically what is a is a is, is an ages old slide. You you could tell when you guys entered into this cavern that this cavern was kind of partially natural and partially created probably from some overzealous mining and causing this great huge collapse. So there's chunks of stone mixed in with this more solidified dirt that sat here compressed under its own weight for for at least a few centuries. So Thulrig's kind of gone kind of silent trying to, to traipse along you could take the, the baton and easily find like a spot where there's a where there's a stone to tap on but but not like a solid stone wall okay yeah that's fine whatever whatever i could do to get sort of a a, a, a resounding unnatural kind of clinking sound out of the python um and then just do you know shave and haircut <laughs> okay. see if i get a response back all right as so as soon as he does that i spin on him okay so Leandra and, and Sirith, without needing in any kind of a, a perception or anything like that, what'd you roll for an Arcana, Sirith? A nine. A nine. You try to think back to your training and, and try to line things up, and nothing falls into place. But while you're concentrating, almost in response to you digging around in the recesses of your mind, you hear this metal on stone rapping, a, 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 a solid tinking sound that is tink, tink, to tink, 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 tink. And it kind of echoes out. And the two of you, Thulrig and Uriel, down below in the cavern, you notice this kind of echo out behind you and, and, and upwards into the cavern gradually reaching out maybe a little further than you might have have realized. And off in the blackness behind you, you hear two pretty solid splashes hitting the water. And off the second splash, you hear almost a slap. And this slap kind of brings to mind like a beaver slapping water or something exiting in with a great tail smacking the water kind of quickly like a fish that you might have re-released back into the water that sort of thing Sirith and leandra you guys both hear this this echoing sound and it comes up and appears in the room and you hear it echo out in great distance when this happens Leon or Sirith, you notice part of the floor at the very far edge breaks away. Maybe a six inch chunk of the floor just vanishes into darkness. And you can hear this chunk of floor, hard stone, hitting off of, of what sounds like rock and, and other bits of stone, and then gradually begin to grow in in, in volume. Both Thorig and Uriel, you also hear from up high above you, maybe 100, 150 feet, a crack sound at the end of your tapping as the echo goes out. And then you hear this loud thunk and then a bit of what sounds definitely like a a, a chunk of stone slapping off of dirt and then stone and then gradually more stuff and the image of a slide kind of plays out in your mind as it kind of grows to a very fairly resounding rumble, which also echoes out into the cavern. I don't think that room's safe to go in, Lee. I think we better stay back. So as soon as he does that and I give him the look and then we hear the splashes, I've given up all semblance of stealth. I'm going to stomp back over to him and grab him by his collar We've been over this before, my friend. Underground, noises travel very, very far, and some of the denizens are not very friendly, despite your constant seeming to think that's the case. We need to be careful. 
I, I was just I was just trying to see if if they would respond to to it, and then we would know that they are not unfriendly. That makes sense, right? And, and as you two begin to converse, the first few pieces of of dirt and rubble begin to descend upon you, and you hear this 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 growing not a roar but a definite earthly rumble of 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 a matter coming down the side of the cliff towards you i'm gonna hustle back the way we came because i know that's clear okay. <laughs> try and get out of the way of the slide i i will follow him okay the two of you backtrack away and and, and as you backtrack away you can see this maybe 10 foot wide slide of earth and stone and and bits of wood um and that sort of stuff Weezits, thank you for the follow. Welcome to our unique and yes, sometimes dysfunctional family. Appreciate the follow, my friend. Um, the, the two of you kind of backtrack and you see this slide come down and you can actually see it kind of in the in the torchlight kind of mound up and the very the, 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 the edge that was coming into the cavern, you can see some of that as it kind of mounds up, begin to shift and kind of tinkle off with little plops and ploops and, and watery sounds into this this body of water that you can't even, with, with the torchlight, see the end of it. But somewhere out there, you did hear the tail slaps. Sirith and Leandra, you both hear the, the, the slide happening. And, and mixed in there, there was an increase in volume of two definitely masculine voices, although one of them was deeper than the other. The, 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 the second one was, was a bit more softer, more kind of a welcoming tone to it that, that might have actually maybe assuage your, your, your maybe senses of, of danger and all that. And the picture comes to your mind of a, of a landslide, as you would see maybe on the edge of a mountain in, 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 in springtime as the snows melt, um, that sort of thing. And you hear the plopping in the water. And then you begin to realize that what you're looking at is definitely the age, edge of a possible cave-in where... It's it's possible that for some weather, some reason, maybe time or natural disasters, earthquakes or dragons descending from the sky above you, caused a great continuing cataclysmic cave in, exposing this great underground uh, 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 cavern. Go ahead and and roll me a, a perception check, both Leandra and Sirith. Welcome to all the new viewers. Just playing some D&D &D today. Pull up a chair. 16. 16. And Leandra. <laughs> I got a 20. Not a natural 20, but 20. All right. So both of you <laughs> can pick out when that, that, that increase in volume comes out, that they're both speaking what appears to be common. And, and the one voice, the deeper one, you, you, a picture of a shorter, stouter figure appears in your mind. And that voice in particular seems strangely and oddly enough to match the decor around you, the carvings, the, the skeletons, the dwarven craftsmanship of this place. That voice seems strangely at home here. The other voice, which was lighter, softer in a way and more welcoming, seems just as much as that one seems to be at home here. The other voice seems just as much to, to be alien to this place. Not necessarily alien in a bad way, but just alien like not from this kind of a place. The, the, the vision of the miners actually plays in your mind a little bit when, when you think or when you hear that deeper voice. Okay. Um. So we hear all this. She's told me that she doesn't think it's safe to go in there, right? Yeah. I'm going to turn to her. I want to talk to her. So I kind of want to like, hey, look. Earlier when I first ran upon you guys, I didn't know what was going on. So 
obviously I'm not the scared little girl that I tried to make myself out to be. Yeah, kind of figured that. I, yeah, okay. <laughs> so my name is Leandra, but Lee, Lee is really, you know, people call me that, so it's cool. I mean, I wasn't really lying. <laughs> lying. <laughs> um, I just think whatever happens, we've been through a little bit now because of that whole, you know, dragon or whatever, and, you know, killer ash. I think we better stick together. Just I agree. There's I'm something going on down there. To that cave in. And I'm yeah. almost wondering if somebody else got trapped down here too. I, and I'm not sure if I can do anything, but that darkness is kind of scaring me. Yeah, it's a little bit unnerving. How, how far is the darkness? Like it 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 goes in about a good Twelve feet, maybe fifteen, before it kind of vanishes off into just this emptiness. The, can the I thing, try something? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Because I have some new things I could do. <laughs> um, Pike position, double twisting gainer. <laughs> can I want to. Can I conjure mage hand and put a candle on it and light that and try to float it through there? One. Um. I mean, yeah. You, I don't know if it would help. You, yeah, you, you, see you could if do we that. could still see it, keep going. Yeah, I was you. actually just gonna suggest I've got some rope. We've got to have something sturdy around here to to like tie off onto, and just to be safe going into that room. Maybe just using the rope tied off to something. He might be a little lighter than me. Maybe having you walk in carefully. I'm okay Maybe with that. And find out what's going on. Sure. I'll hold on to the rope to make sure it stays secure. All right. All right. Um. Yeah, that that I mean that that's possible. I mean, if you, if you're talking about tying off to something and and, and just lowering your way down. Yeah. Well, lowering me down. Saying, tying off the rope to something secure, <laughs> like a, a pillar or. Okay. Yeah. There, there's the pillars in the in the, in the main feast hall for sure. Okay, and then basically staying with the rope, making sure that I hold on to it so it doesn't come loose or something like that, and having her just kind of slowly go in there. That way, if there's any, you know, ground give ways or whatever, then I can just pull her back up. So you just have talking about going in, what, to the edge or actually sending her over yeah, the edge? Yeah, into the edge and having her with a, a torch so that she can see in there and, yeah. and see what's going on. Okay, yeah, how much fun do you Go ahead. Dark vision too. So, yeah. how many feet of rope do you have? Uh, fifty. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 enough to to tie off to one of the pillars, and 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 then get to the edge of of the room. Sure, sure, sure. I also okay. have fifty feet of rope. Okay. <laughs> so are you gonna go back out into the, the main feast hall, tie off to one of the pillars, tie the other to her, and then send her into the edge? Yeah. Okay. And I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna stay there holding the rope. Probably wherever the tie is at, just to make sure it stays secure. Okay, so you tie off the rope to, to Leandra. You make sure it's it's secure. Leandra has a torch in hand. The, the flame blazing up, crackling, giving off that kind of pitch tar kind of smell from the from the wrappings. And a little bit of that wafts up into your nose, Leandra. Um, you, you, Sirith, go over and, and tie the other end off to, to one of the pillars. Um, and signal to, to, to Leandra to go ahead and, and go into the room. Leandra, are you going to take any special precautions as you enter the room? Or are you just going to kind of hop, skip, and a jump toddle on in there? Um, I'm going to try to be very stealthy okay. and, um, and very carefully, you know, take super slow steps. Okay, go ahead and roll me first a stealth. What's your roll? What, nine, a 19 plus 8, so okay. 27. Okay, just barely. Um, <laughs> you you managed to, to quietly placing your feet um, in, in just the right form with just the amount, right amount of pressure. You managed to kind of almost tiptoe across the floor. Go ahead, uh, roll me, Sirith, a perception check, if you'd be so kind. be a natural 20 plus one so 21 natural Wee -wee. 20 okay you your ear as you're kind of sitting there kind of in in and i'm assuming you kind of maybe 
guide the rat the, the wrap of the rope around your body kind of in that mm-hmm. that mountain climber kind of just ready for for the floor to give way and have to catch your weight and as you're sitting there with your, your feet pressed out in, 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 in a locked position kind of guarding for, for 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 the floor to give way your ear your right ear the ear kind of facing off towards the 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 entrance way you came in from the mines you hear somewhere out there distantly the, the crack of, of stone and the falling away of earth. It, it's distant, but it definitely is come. The sound comes in to, to the room that you're in. Leandra, you move to the edge. You have torch in hand. You can see now, as the torchlight comes, how there's jagged bits of stone in, in, in a disheveled pattern. And you can see where the back end of the room and the walls to this room actually fell away during this, this great cataclysmic cave-in however many centuries ago. You can see now that, that, that this t- kind of a tongue of stone that you're on stretches out over a great cavernous region. You can hear bits of of stone tinking down the sides of the walls, some of them way out in a great distance. You can hear like things plopping into water. You can hear out in the distance maybe the running of water like a crick or, or possibly a thin waterfall falling through the darkness. And as you get to the edge and, and you have your torch kind of out in front of you and you, you look over, you see maybe 150 feet down another torch. And at first you think just briefly that, that it, it's a reflection of your torch because you do you are able to see like the reflective surface of, of almost glass like water, but it doesn't line up and you realize as you see the glow kind of wrap around the shoulders and head of, of two figures a hundred and some feet down below you. You can't make out any fine details. Thulrig and Uriel down in the bottom of this cave in at the edge of, of this body of water or one of the bodies of water. You're not sure how if this is one big body or if it's several smaller ones. You, you're casting a glance up and, and watching as the last little bits of, of the slide descend down the slope. You look up and you see from way up there kind of a tongue kind of illuminated the, the edge of it. You can see it almost looks kind of like a strange diving board or a cliff up there. And you see a torch being held out and over. And you see the light, the firelight from the torch washing back over another figure. You can't quite make out all the details and stuff, but it definitely is slight of build and does give off the air of being feminine. So your lights are kind of playing against each other. You're both, and like I said, about 125, 150 feet in distance. One group looking up, the other person looking down. We'll start with Thulrig and Uriel. Huh. Well, I guess there are some women down here. I told you. I mean, I, I've never, ever heard a woman's voice and there not being a woman. <laughs> Fair point. Uh, <laughs> however, we've got to be careful. Not everything down here is friendly, despite what you seem to think. <clears throat> and I'm going to kind of shout up. We'd appreciate it if you didn't keep dropping rocks on us. <clears throat> Please. <laughs> this definite male voice echoes up out of the cavern, followed by, again, the, 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 the first voice that comes up, a very thick, hearty, you, you, can, you, can, you can feel this, this earthiness to it, and it does indeed sound like it belongs in this kind of an environment. The other voice that says, please, that comes up behind it, not feminine, but way too welcoming. 
for for something for this kind of a setting. This is this is the setting of of hard men, of adventurers, of those people, those men that go looking for danger, or those women that go looking for danger. Because you're in a place that you could easily picture a great dragon or a huge giant or a malefic and vile necromancer conjuring up the dead from, from, from long lost stone caverns, raising that sort of thing, not please echoing up from the bottom of a cavern. But they don't seem to be intent on any kind of danger. Go ahead and roll me an insight, would you there, Leandra? Okie dokie. Nine. Okay, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna break the, the the immersion there for a second, Genie. This week we need to go down to the game store. We need to find the perfect set of dice and send it to Jen's because this is <laughs> bad. Um. Anyway. Yep. <laughs> Anyways. I'm not, I'm not that, even that's with the plus like, three. Just to send her something to use besides those dice. So so the voices come <laughs> up. They're definitely male. You you try to to get a feel and and as a rogue. You're used to skulking in the shadows and, and judging targets and, and, and judging people's intentions and, and being able to gain a little bit of unseen insight into their intentions. But this isn't the streets of some city. This isn't the streets that you left uh, so long ago in, in Norsewall before you headed, headed up here. This environment is completely alien, and whether it's the echoing, whether it's the just the environment, it it doesn't play into your hand, and you're not able to get a feel. But you do hear their words. You're able to make that out. And they said, "Stop dropping rocks on them, please." Well, yeah, stop dropping rocks on us, please. <laughs> and I'm like definitely thinking that is so weird. Um, well, I look over to like, is somebody down there? As, as this definite female figure looks down upon you, Thulrig and Uriel, the, the, the light is cast. Go ahead, if you would, Leandra, and give me a description of your character from the shoulders up. Um, uh, well, she's got, uh, Uh, she's got like a you know traveling cloak on or something with the hood's probably up but her hair's down she probably got a couple braids is blonde she's got blue eyes she's pale skinned um the, i mean you know that see me with the torch in my hand or whatever and, and she looks very young she's very young uh she's i think 20 i is she's like 20 or something so and she's half elf uh, they might be able to see her half elf ears poking out a little bit i mean she doesn't have she's not totally concealing herself with the the hood just it's just there um and and she's peering over so if they can see her face yeah she you, just looks like this she doesn't look very threatening Thulrig <laughs> and, and uriel what what yeah you you as as, as this figure kind of leans ever closer to the edge of, of, of this kind of cliff face. And, and, the, and the, the torch kind of comes down almost in a natural, effortless kind of motion. And the light from the torch washes back up through the firelit glow that, that kind of covers her shoulders and her face. You can see the outline edge and deeper internal shadows that would be caused from a traveling cloak. And you see highlighted golden tresses of hair kind of follow out a, a little bit of a, a palish pallor to the skin and definitely youthful. There's something, however, about the face that at first you think definitely some kind of human bloodline, that sort of thing, but there's a little bit of an oddity to the way the face is cut and carved. This looks down on you and she says what she says, her voice coming and dropping down on top of you. Definitely a youthful female. Strange and odd to be in a place like this. Well, obviously, little girl, 
<clears throat> I just yelled at you. <clears throat> Do you happen to know the way out of here? We've been lost for a short time, and we would both love an ale. It's it's not been that short, really. I mean, we've been down here for quite a while. Uh, but hey, if a you if you've got food, short. that would be great. Food would be awesome, and we'd be happy to to help you if you need help as well. While I'm talking, my eyes are going up to her, and then also back down and scanning the water, making sure okay. nothing's coming towards us. As these voices float up and their torchlights, a lot of times when you, when you you have a tendency to kind of try to extend light to see what it is you're talking to in a dark environment, that sort of thing. The light falls down over their faces. Starting with Thulrig, please give me the description of what, what this person would, from this distance would at least see or the impression they'd get as the, as the light of the torch kind of falls back over your, your upper body. She wouldn't see, like, probably from the shoulders down. All right. Uh, definitely broad shoulders. I mean, this is definitely a dwarf. Um, he's not rotund from you can tell but he's definitely solidly built um the most striking thing you probably catch from this distance is his hair uh probably almost looks white in the firelight maybe taking on the colors of the flames a little bit um but it's not like the white of like age where it's kind of dull white there's a shininess here um like a highlight that you can't quite place um Definitely wearing well-traveled, like, cloak. Um, <clears throat> and you see, like, a bow and some arrows slung over his shoulder by his backpack. Big, full beard. Um, you can probably can't make out too much from this angle. As, like I said, he kind of looks up towards you and then back down. So you're kind of getting a very kind of quick glance at his beard. And Uriel. So, um, so from Euro, he's he's much taller than Thulgren. He's he's uh, easily taller, and uh, as striking as as Thulgren's hair is white, um, Uriel's skin is equally white, nearly radiant uh, white. Um, he has uh, silver metallic eyes, and uh, you can see that he is not wearing any sort of cloak. He's very open. Um, his face is not covered at all. And he has long blonde hair, um, straight blonde hair that, uh, that comes down past his shoulders. Um, he, looks, he looks young, um, but it's, it's almost deceptively young. All righty. So the, the, these male voices respond to you. Sirith, you can hear something scraping. It's, it's a distance away. It's not like it's approaching fast, but there's something definitely out in those mines that, that's making its way in towards you or towards this chamber. It's been a few moments since Leandra disappeared inside of the room. And, and Leandra, you sense a slight shift at your feet you hear this kind of kind of crackling breaking sound coming from behind you thorig and uriel you hear the the, the tinkling again of, of bits of earth and stone and you hear this crack resound with a loud snap as suddenly leandra the floor beneath your feet breaks away and begins descending down the 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 slide below you. You can hear now all three, Leandra, Thulrig, and Uriel from your different positions, this great huge chunk of earth and stone slam in to the side of the, of the earthen wall coming down and bigger pieces beginning to break loose. This slide promising to be a lot larger than the last one as this, this bit of stone, and you can see between the light, you see this great big shadowed chunk of stone and earth, and you can see where the stone eventually breaks away. A big chunk of it breaks away, exits out into the open air of the cavern as the other part begins to break away as it's coming down, releasing other small pieces. That big chunk kind of slowly arcs out into the cavern, its momentum carrying it 
probably a good 40, 50 feet, 60 feet through the air as it begins its arc down towards what's probably going to be a loud splash in the water. Leandra, your feet suddenly kind of scrambling for some kind of purchase in the air. Sirith, you feel a shift on the rope. Um, not a lot at first, but a definite kind of tug. Leandra, you're able to kind of cast a glance back, and you can see maybe two, three feet behind you, you see the remaining edge of the room where the stone that you were on broke away. Go ahead and make me a dexterity save to see if you're able to actually kind of throw your body back and hook your fingers into that. Uh, straight dicks. Dexterity, uh, yeah, dexterity save. A save? Yeah. 16. 16. You manage to actually, as as it breaks away, this does harken back to your days in the city of running across roofs, tracking targets, moving stealthily in the night, following people, whether it was with an intended target or, or practice to hone your skills. As this shifts away, you, you instinctually turn, spin your body, and fling out with your hands, finding actually a very good purchase because the cobbles or the marbled stone pieces that were there were actually grouted or routed in. So you're actually able to reach out and get your fingers into one of these as your feet kind of hit the edge of the stone. Sirith, you feel like a definite tightening on the rope. You hear this great crashing and rumbling. You might even have heard a gasp escape Leandra's vocal cords as, as the ground beneath her gave way. Um, the, the, the rope goes tight. Are you going to try and like immediately kind of pull? Are you going to react back into it? Okay, yep. go ahead and, and, and at first, go ahead, go ahead and roll me a dexterity just to see how much of the rope gets, gets, gets free of you. It would be a 10. You manage to actually grab onto it almost instantly. So none of the rope goes. And, and you feel that tightening. And then it kind of releases. And actually goes slack as you, Leandra, or Leandra, manage to quickly pull yourself back up onto the edge. However, in the tumbling stone and rock, Thulrig and Uriel, you see her torch kind of once, then twice. And then eventually swallowed up in the dirt and the rock. You're not sure for sure if, if she made it away. You never saw a rope around her or anything. You just saw kind of this, this like kind of a, a lip, like a diving board almost kind of shape break loose and, and the, the rock and the stone begin falling and then her torch kind of tumbling and then getting swallowed up into the earth. Like I said, you see this big chunk of stone. It, it doesn't, the slide doesn't come anywhere near you, but this big chunk of stone flies out 50, 60 feet and begins its descent, slamming into the surface of, of this icy cold like lake here in the cavern with a horrendous splash that, that echoes out into the distance. And you can hear critters in the darkness kind of skittering and sliding away. You hear bits and pieces of the rest of the fall begin to tink off the surface of the water. And then something out in the distance. Go ahead and roll me a perception check. Thulrig and Uriel. Damn it. I rolled a 7 plus 2. Uh, zero, so seven. I rolled an eleven. An eleven is just enough to hear, as things kind of begin to settle. There's a little bit of of, of splashing sound from a few of the the, the slightly bigger, maybe ham fisted sized pieces of of rock that fall in. But from deeper out in the darkness, you hear this kind of grating sound of of like petrified wood on stone or something like that and then you hear in the darkness Thurig <laughs> it echoes a little bit fades out and that's where we're going to take our first break tonight ladies and gentlemen we'll come back in about 5 to 10 minutes thank you for coming to 
for us at the table and hanging out with us for this episode, episode four of Adventure Weekly. We'll be right back. Five, ten minutes, hang out, pull up a chair. Good time to go get some mead, some ale, play some dragon bones with your orcish friends, and we'll be back shortly.
Everybody out there in Twitch land, hope everybody is doing fantastic. I'm going to throw this unabashed little bit of, of promo out there. If you have a desire to play Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition or one of the other many games that we're going to be bringing to this channel, you can find that information down below. As of this morning, I've changed the way that you can get involved here on this channel as a player and a Dungeon Master. All you have to do is drop, at the minimum, a follow on our Twitch channel and go over to our Discord. Get involved over there. Let me know that you want to be a player or a Dungeon Master, and we'll take it from there. So back to our story. The landslide has finished. Leandra, you've managed to pull yourself up. Uriel, you're oblivious to any sounds coming from the darkness. Thulrig, however, you did hear this deep guttural moaning and what sounded like two pieces of stone moving, grinding against each other or maybe old petrified wood sliding or grinding against each other. Dry and jagged. Echoing from somewhere out in the deeper darkness. God damn it. There goes any chance of whatever's down here not knowing we're here. Uriel's still staring up at the at the ledge. He, he reaches over and this time he's the one slapping Thorig's arm. We've got to help her. She she's she could have fallen. She could be anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, she's probably dead. Don't say that. She might need healing. Keep your voice down. There's something else down here with us. Where? And not over there. And I'm going to gesture. I don't know what it is, but there was definitely a deep guttural sound of something waking up. <clears throat> or I don't know. Uh, my guess is we don't want to draw its attention. Uh, Chuck, with this, so you said we had this like diving board. Was it like on the other side of the slide? So like the slide. No, that's what down. she was standing on. Okay, so it started at the top of the slide. Yeah. So like the slide, and then it came up to the platform. Yeah, yeah. Probably about a hundred and twenty-five or so feet up above you. How steep is that slide? Extreme. I mean, it starts out kind of sloped going up, but after about twenty-five feet, it it, it goes pretty much vertical. All right, Uriel, the way I see it, we've got two choices. Continue along by where the slide is, or we try and climb up and go out the way that those two came in. Well, I mean, do you think we can make it? It's it's, it's like a cliff. It's not going to be easy, but obviously they had to come in some way. I mean, I could just fly up there. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. You know, it's a... <laughs> If that's if that's what you want me to do, I mean, but but how are you going to get up? Do you still have your rope? Well, yes, I I keep it right where you told me to keep it on the side of the pouch. Give me your rope. Sure, here you go. And I'm gonna take his rope and my rope and tie it together in such a way that it's not gonna come apart. Magical knot work and all that. Okay, so you got about ninety eight feet of rope. All right. <laughs> yes. So it's about it's fairly an easy climb up at the first twenty five feet. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Uriel, go ahead and fly up there. See if you can find someone to tie that off with. Maybe if you find her bag, she has some rope we can add to this, uh, and then I will climb up after you find her bag i mean wouldn't she also oh oh she's dead she doesn't need it anymore no i don't think she is i really don't uh, i don't just fly but out I'll, there I'll, tie the yeah, rope yeah, off yeah i got this i got this. give it back to me okay sirith as, as you're holding the rope and the rope once again goes goes limp in your grip and you see leandra kind of scramble towards the entrance Kind of in a way that lets you know that, yeah, the, the the edge probably broke loose on her. Leandra kind of peeking your head kind of back out into the to the to the feast hall. You, your back rested up against that that great carved pillar. Two things happen. You 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 easily both your senses heightened at this point on alert for anything. You hear this kind of. <laughs> 
come from out by where the, the mines were at. And then you both noticed the two great doors that exited out of this room where you found the, the spike trap. You see a glowing firelight emanating in that hallway, just beginning to spill in to this room. You hear footfalls in the hallway, in the dust, something tinking off what only you could think is, is, is one of those spikes. Are you sure this is where they came? Are you sure this is where you saw them? This is where they were. I can assure you of it. The fleshy ones were over this way. You better be right. I don't want to be... They're over here. You hear these voices begin to argue back and forth. The picture that comes to your head is of these small, squeamish kind of little wiry creatures. You've heard voices like this before in the past. It reminds you of goblin kin. As the door that you came in from the mine slams open, both of the doors cracking, one of them literally ripping and pulling off of its hinges with a great metallic rending sound as it folds over and open, the other one splitting in the middle from the impact of whatever it was that flung it open. You can see the top piece rend off this great tearing sound as it slams into the wall, skitters and lands maybe a foot and a half thick shelf of stone that was once part of that door now sits and rests between you and Leandra in that room. You see these great hulking shoulders at first, dark brown, leathery. You can see what strangely looks like two big leather straps over it and a great black iron collar. As this form fills your view, fills the area where the doors were. You can see the, the, the walls on each side being 10 feet apart, pressing in on this great, huge beast's shoulders. Big, flabby, sagging jowls hang down from its cheeks. A big, giant, bulbous nose, deep set, very unintelligent looking eyes kind of glare in over these thick overhanging stone-like brows with big bushy caterpillar-like eyebrows. The head going back looks for the most part to be bald and then the light from the room catches this top knot that disappears behind it. The head looks as though it sits on top of these great thick shoulders. Its lips thick flat, crackled, little bits of, of, of exposed raw flesh kind of curl up at the side. Mm -hmm. There you are, as it tries to immediately push in, its shoulders sliding. You can hear this fleshy sound as the shoulders drag, getting caught where the walls kind of curved in just a little bit where the doors were at. Remember, they were recessed kind of in so the hinges were hidden. So when it blew out, the stone kind of jagged off and it kind of catches itself and lets out this great <laughs> guttural roar that empties in to the chamber that you're in. This creature <coughs> does not look like anything you particularly care to fight at this point in time. You find yourselves... In this room, one exit recess where this big giant creature is and easily a dozen footsteps skittering around at the other exits. You can see several points of firelight emanating out of there, just barely beginning to dump into the room and your eyes, yours, Sirith, out of the corner, you see killer ass broken and torn body and the open chest and the muckiness of the mimic that was there. You remember the items, that there are items in that box. Leandra, you see both of these things out of the corner of your eyes. Your eyes also fall on Killeris torn and broken body and the chest that was there. 
How much of this can I hear down there? I'm assuming I hear the crash. Go ahead and roll me. Go, me. go ahead and roll me a perception check. That's going to be a 25. You hear the crash. You hear this great guttural roar as if like some giant beast that's angered. You do not, however, hear the pattering footsteps and the chattering of these goblin creatures. Okay. So exactly what I kind of expected to hear. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let out a whistle to get Uriel's attention and gesture for him to come back down. We're not going that way anymore. So, Uriel, as you begin to, to, to elevate yourself up, you hear from behind you down below Thorig's whistle. Are you going to pay him any mind or are you going to continue upwards? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I pause and I, I look down at him and just kind of cock my head to the side. Like, I, we, this wasn't an agreed upon form of communication. I mean, he got mad at me when I tanked on rock, and now he's whistling. I don't, I don't understand. So I will just whistle back. It's killing me. So, so, so Uriel kind of pauses in in, in mid flight, looks back down, and kind of cocks his head to you, Thorig, and 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 does nothing more than 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 whistle back towards you. You see him begin to furiously motion. Oh, there's my cat. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Uriel uh, sees him pantomiming coming back down and just kind of holds up his hands and points downward. Like, you want me back down there now? Yes. Come here. Cat butt. <laughs> he looks very confused for a moment and then he slowly descends back down to where mm-hmm. Thorig is. Okay. What 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 is it? Did you not hear the loud crashing sound and then the loud growl originating from up there? Uh Uriel looks back up and he, he just kind of stares for a moment. I, I don't think I did, but that sounds like they need help. They're dead. We're going this way. You're very pessimistic. We're not dead. (laughs) We're not dead. (laughs) You're very pessimistic, friend. We don't know that they're dead, but we do know they need help. We saw her fall into the landslide. Chances are she's dead. If she's not dead, she'll be dead soon. I'd rather take my chance with whatever this is down here than whatever caused that loud crashing up there. Not on the table, buddy. Sorry. Well, I trust you, Thorig. You've kept me safe for the last couple weeks, so we'll we'll do what you're saying. <coughs> but I do think we should try to help them. Just just voicing my concern, just putting it out there. <coughs> like I said, one's probably already dead. The other one will be dead soon. So there's not much we can do. It's going to take us time to get up there. By the time we get up there, they'll be dead. Well, I was I already there. Know. Like I was, I was almost halfway up before you Fine. whistled at me. You go check. By the way, I'm why, why did ahead. you whistle? What is that? That to is not a degree of communication. I mean, what does that even mean? To look at me, so I can motion you back. Oh, well, that's that's actually quite effective. Thank you for explaining that. Yes, I'll tell you what. You go check. See how close to being dead they are. I'm gonna scout ahead. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to Sir- start moving forward. Sirith <laughs> right. and, and Leandra, you, your, your attention peeled away from the, the great gaping chasm that you now know is back there, Leandra. Th- this great, meaty, huge, the word obese would, would normally come to mind when you see something built this way and of this great girth. But it seems to fall short in this situation because this thing is far beyond obese and you can see it roaring, just trying to break through out of this of, the, of, of what's, what's restraining it. And you see with a great rending piece, the rock face breaks away and its shoulder comes into the room it's thrown slightly off balance and and you think you're gonna about to watch this great big lumbering hulk of a creature 
this monstrosity of, of some ill-tempered wizard's creation kind of flop and flubber into the room. And, and you almost kind of feel elated because if anything, that's going to give you a chance to react. And then your blood runs cold as this creature with some unseen dexterity and quickness writes itself rather like a dancer would coming out of a pirouette. It's an odd, odd bit of a movement and you almost have to bite back a chuckle when you see it. You hear the grating of the doors at the other end as these goblins almost crawling over the top of each other come into the room. A dozen or so of them fighting for purchase, fighting to be the first one to sink their gnarly little yellow jagged teeth into you. These yellowish red eyes glowing out with ferocity as they tumble over each other into the room. The, 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 the lanterns or, or firelights they were carrying, some of them being extinguished, tossed to the ground and that sort of thing. Your exits to either side seeming to be blocked. A, a bit of urgency begins to build up inside of you. The easier the two ways out would probably be the goblins. Go ahead and roll me an insight. Both Leandra and Sirith. Eight. So, leave it alone. Thirteen. Thirteen. Leandra. Strangely, up to, up to this point, it seems to be Sirith that has been able to, to discern things. But as you look over, you see this flash of almost panic upon Sirith's face as her eyes flick from the big creature to one side to this 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 wailing mound of of of, of goblins coming in from the other side. And her eyes flicking back and forth. And for the first time, you actually see Sirith Thran, the paladin, begin to, to, to lose her composure. You see the, the great black kind of scarring, spiderweb scarring that comes up her face and blackens her, her finer features. Kind of pulses a little bit, kind of quickly with that glowing undertone of red as her eyes flash back and forth. To you, the two viable options does not include going anywhere near this hulking beast that has now rose up to full nine foot height, easily being a foot wider than it is tall. It's rose up that way appears not to be an option the goblins don't appear to be that big of threat um you did dispatch a mimic which was probably a much more difficult fight you see maybe eight nine goblins now getting their bearings as they come in jagged little tooth swords in their hands rusty metal a couple of them have very crudely made brass knuckles that have spikes on them all of their eyes are flashing and beginning to focus one by one on you and Sirith. but they don't exactly send a great bit of fear through you they're kind of stunted they're not standing at the the three foot a little bit taller height they're more closer to two feet and are rather scrawny some of them have these, these distended bellies that one would get from starvation. They look very hungry. Some of them are kind of holding these swords, which should be wielded with one hand with two hands, maybe shaking a little bit. They look famished. They look desperate. And then there's the cavern behind you. You know there's water out there, so possibly jumping down and sliding and landing in the water or just taking your chances and launching yourselves. If only you had a car, you could reenact some great movies from the past and drive off the ledge into your, your unknown future. That's the situation that, that you gather in as, as you're looking and assessing things. Um, where is um, Sirith in relation to me and where the creatures all are? Sirith is, is about seven feet off to your left towards the door that you guys initially came into. 
She's got her okay. back pressed up against this great stone pillar that reaches up to the night carved night sky. And she's holding on to the rope still with her eyes kind of flicking back and forth. Um, she does look very, dis- beginning to look more and more distraught, not very settled. And the other things, the big guy and the goblins are coming from the other side. No, from the, two the, different the, yeah, the, no, the, the big guy just came in through from the mine entrance where you guys initially came in. So he's literally, from the point of his great, big, enormous belly to Sirith is about six or seven feet. The goblinoids are coming in from the other area where Killerash had discovered the spike trap that entered into that hallway. They have spilled into the room from that direction, and they are closer to about 65, 75 feet that direction. Okay, well, I'm going to call out to, or, well, she's right there, I guess. Um, I'm like, there's some guys down there. Maybe we should just jump down there because I don't think we want to fight these things. I say we go down there. I can help us. I got something that will help us fall and not hurt ourselves. Or we can use the rope. I don't know if the rope's long enough. But I think we should go down there and maybe these guys can help us out. If you think you can get us down there safely, I'm yes. all for it. I don't want to have to deal with these things. I'm already hurt. so. Uh, yeah. Um, I can... If she's willing to jump down there with me, I I will you know we'll, I will cast Featherfall on both of us and we can jump down there. Let's do it. Let's take the rope with me. Yeah, and I've also got rope. All right. Rope. So at this point, Uriel, you're about halfway up, back up. Thulrig, you're, you're you're standing down at the bottom. You can hear a commotion coming, interrupting from up top. It's very possible that, that as much as you may not want to admit it, that Uriel was right. And that these two or three or four people, however many are up there, are still alive and in some form of distress. From Leandra and Sirith and Uriel, I would like, please, an initiative roll. And the DM is ill-prepared today, does not have his initiative card, so we're doing this old school. Shame. We're doing it live. We're doing it live. I got a 21. Sirith. Seven. Oh, that's good. And Leandra. Fifteen. Fifteen. Uriel, you you continue your your descent up, and now you begin to hear these kind of gravelly, groveling, kind of strange little (laughs) sounds kind of coming from, from where you saw this young, youthful female disappear to, and you then hear that replaced by this great guttural... Leandra... And 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 Sirith, out of the corner of your eye, you see this great giant creature raise its meaty Get it away. club-like arm and hand and fist high into the air, kind of like a great ape getting ready to smash down on its its opponents. And you see these great gobs of flab just rolling off of this thing. Disgustingly, you think you actually see a decaying hand stuck in one of these bits of flab. As it raises up, the flab shifts ever so slightly. You see this hand kind of flop out from underneath of it. Bits of, of decaying flesh drooping down. It, it kind of sends the, the willies up your up your spine as this thing raises up to pummel down on you. But, Leandra, you get first move in this situation. Uriel, you will not be able to enter combat this round. Oh. Okay. Um, well, I kind of like... I, I'm going to yell down to the cavern. I'm like, we're going to try to help you. But we need help first. <laughs> and I will jump down there. I mean, I cast the feather ball. And 
I don't know if we the rope is unhooked now and we're taking it with us or whatever. Sirith is not with you yet. She is oh, okay. still over by the pillar. You guys have not had a chance to 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 enact you two coming together, turning and running. The 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 this this great meaty handed giant is you're going first, then the giant is going. Sirith Again, she looks like she's beginning to come apart at the seams. You see oh. her eyes okay. flickering back and forth, and they finally <laughs> focus and trail up this great flab-filled, shaking giant creature. I, 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 if she's not with me, ready to jump yet, and is in peril, I will not jump yet. All right, I will. Can, can I hold? Thank you yeah. for the five hundred bits. Leandra, on your next roll, you have a plus five thanks to a Zangoose. How come nobody ever gives Thanks. me any help? Because we're the ones that die. I, I, get, also I die. get the feeling you guys don't like me. Don't listen to that, guys. He's playing to your heartstrings. He doesn't <laughs> Thanks, Zangoose. So you're going to hold off, Leandra? I, I will, um, if I can hold my yeah. action oh, or yeah. whatever, um, I want to make sure she doesn't get attacked by that big thing okay. as she makes her way over. All if righty. he does, I will do something. <laughs> All righty. All righty. So just as your mind kind of sets, you, you can basically hold one action. You have to declare what that action is going to be. You can't, like, hold... The, the feather fall and then change that out at the last minute for an attack. So you have to either decide because there is the possibility that this thing could come, kind of come clubbing down and because of its awkwardness and the and the way that, that, that Sirith is positioned, it could miss. Then Sirith could cross the room to you and at that point you could go ahead feather fall and, and go for it. Or... Okay, well, feather... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Well, feather fall is like a reaction. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if I could cast it, you know, before. You, you can't hold the reaction. What? You can't hold the reaction or a bonus action. So you so can you react can to her. You could hold it and react to her coming to you. So you could go ahead. Since you're going to use it as a reaction, you could use it to react to her coming, running across. Okay. Well, in, in reactions, you don't, you don't have to. Um... Yeah, you don't have to hold that. So you okay. can, they can be used on anybody's turn. So right. You can, you you can go ahead and hold there. an attack, but you have to declare what exactly it is. Okay. Like whether you're going to hold, hold a spell or you're going to hold a weapon attack, you have to declare what that is. I, I will hold um, a, a firebolt attack. Okay. Um, if that thing tries to get her before she can get out of the way. To All right. Me. This this great flab filled giant moves with with more speed and celerity than you would expect, and quickly that fist begins to travel downwards to either impact the pillar or slam down on top of poor little Sirith. You can go ahead and since you held your action, launch your firebolt at this point in time. Okay. So that's a regular attack. Or a, it's a magic attack. Uh, which dice do I choose? <laughs> Remember, you got a plus five to use. I know. Oh, I don't think I need it. This. How, can I hold that plus five? No. No, you have to announce if you're taking it. Yeah. It, I it, mean, it, no, you can't hold the plus but, five. It's for your next roll. Okay, so well then, I will definitely hit. Because Only the DM can hold things like that because I never get them. I got a, a 14, then plus 5, plus 5 is 20. Or 14 plus 10, 24. All right, so the bolt, quickly you see, Sirith, a snap from, from Leandra's hand. Kind of like a gunslinger in a sun-up kind of new high noon duel. Snap out. With the, this, this, okay, you, you recall back to when you first met Leandra and she tried filling your mind with this big, great, giant bullshit story that she's some kind of wiffy little innocent child just lost about in the sewers beneath the great city of Wind and all this other stuff. 
This I kind cannot. of speed and reaction is is shocking, and your eyes actually it pulls you in. I mean, your eyes get big as you focus on her, and this bolt of fire snaps out, crosses the room, and explodes. And when it impacts this giant, you immediately hear this crackling, bubbling sound of flame melting flesh. A roar begins to build up, and you can see these flabby waves just emit across this thing's great gelatinous, flubber filled body. Go ahead and roll me some damage, would you, Leandra? I don't get to add anything to my damage. Oh, God, that sucks. Plus a, a three. Three. Hmm. I don't get any pluses. It, it slams into it. And, and more probably out of shock and surprise than damage. The, the, the thing lets out this roll. Ah, oh, this roar. Thank you, Azangoose. I love Azangoose. Azangoose is a very special oh. person. Thank you for the 500 bits and a plus five bonus to the dungeon master. As the creature begins to, to roar out in pain and shock and excitement, his fist continues to travel down. He strikes downward. It, it, the unprepared, ill-prepared seeth, seeth with disadvantage. But <laughs> I get a plus five because of, of the great, mighty, and wise Zangus. I told you don't listen to him. He doesn't need it. But since Zangus couldn't find it in his black heart to give a plus 10 to the dungeon master, the giant's great ham sized, I mean, it's the size of a pig, comes blazing down. It slams into the, the stone pillar. You hear this great crack resonate through the hallway you hear these squeaks erupt from the now frightened goblins who were unaware that you had a giant as a friend and a pal and that their presence in here would anger him as his fist cracks the pillar and pieces from the ceiling fall down the fist comes down missing you Sirith, by a good foot or two but you feel and hear the impact hit the ground right next to you. You see and hear the, f the stones on the floor crack and break in. But this excites your blood. You realize, no, I don't really want to be here any longer. And it becomes your turn, your chance to move. You see Leandra. Yeah, Leandra standing there kind of with this look come on look kind of egging you forward i <laughs> his hand is like right in front of me or? no it's right to your side and, and it, it literally like you were kind of still leaned up against the post so this fist that just hit the ground is 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 probably four about three and a half feet four feet up Hey, Grumbleskin, thank you for the $10. We are one step closer to TwitchCon in October. Rock on. Thank you very much, my friend. Let's see here. Um, I'm just going to haul ass towards Lee. Yeah. I'm not even going to bother with this thing. It's way too much. All righty, Zangoose with the 300 bits giving me a re-roll. Now, re-rolls you can hold. Yes, I'm uh. making the rules up as I go along. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you can use your movement to, to quickly cover the ground, and you would have both you, Leandra, and you, Sirith, would have enough movement to make it to the edge. And if diving off, is, is, is what you want to do. You, you, would, you would be able to do that before anybody else would be able to react. Okay. I, as I'm hauling ass towards her, I'm like, Lee, do your spell. <laughs> Reaction. All right. You guys Animal. run towards the ledge. Leandra casting off the, the Featherfall spell. 
<laughs> as you both dive out into the inky blackness of the cavern. Uriel, you're right there. You can see the edge, the thickness of the stone as your head's just about to crest over the top and you hear this footfalls quickly approaching you as you see these two figures launch over your head out in the cavern behind you. And then you hear from inside, from the direction they came, this great, huge, angry, guttural roar and these big, thick, stone-crumbling footfalls just (gasps) coming your direction. And somewhere behind it, the chai-pitched chittering that brings to your mind chipmunks in spring doing the mating dance. Is kind of what it brings to, to your to your mind as these figures dive off over the top. Thulrig, you see this. You see Uriel kind of slowly kind of going up, going up. And then you see these, like just as he's about, you see these figures dive out into the darkness and then begin almost as if they were feathers to just kind of fall so slowly through the air, down into the cavern. Sirith, Leandra, you see down below you the the smooth, the impossibly smooth reflection of of inky black water. The only light being cast on it is is the light from Thulrig's torch. And you realize that, that, that you have no real directional control. So you're just kind of floating down, going straight for the water. What are you going to do, Uriel? So um, I think it's important to note as well that uh, as a part of what I'm using to ascend, they would have seen these giant, luminous, incorporeal wings sprouted from my back um, as I was going up. Um, And as they kind of jumped over me, I would have just kind of watched in awe as they kind of jumped over and then started floating, and I would have been like, wow, that's so cool. I wish I could do that. <laughs> and that's what happens. You, you two kind of dive, and as you dive out, you see this figure with these luminous wings floating upwards or flying upwards stop and watch you go out. And as you're kind of, and you you might even actually be kind of looking back underneath you towards him because it is the last thing you expected to see with something flying up towards where you guys are trying to escape from. And you would probably look and, and you hear this voice. Once again, the voice is so misplaced. Now even more so with this great flabby giant and, and ill-fed, starving, ravenous goblins behind you that just enhances the, the gloominess of this place, the, the forlorn, long-lost feel of this place. Here's this bright, almost chipper, overly friendly voice calling out how cool it is that you're able to float through the air. And you can see this look of wonderment across his face. You could help direct us. Direct? Direct? direct. Yes. Yes, I can. And I will, uh, I will like fly. If I can still use my movement, I'll fly over to them and just kind of put my arm like around each one of them. And then just kind of fly us towards the ground. Okay. Our All right. So th- this 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 good job. This this person, this being, you're you're not sure what to make of him. He's flying. He's got wings. Kind of this whole angelic thing going on, I guess, in in, in a way. It takes you and and begins to guide you down away from the water to down towards this obvious waiting dwarf. You hear. This, this this great thundering. And you can picture in your heads, everybody hears it, as these great meaty fists up above are just pummeling furiously with these loud thunking slaps on the stone, trying to pound his way into the room where you guys escape to, through 
the the thick stone because the door to where you guys went to was was is way no he, there's no way he could make it through and then you hear stone crack and you begin to think that maybe there's a way that he can make it through you're not sure as you land softly on the ground this 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 figure with wings this short stout Reminds you, this dwarf reminds you of of you, Leandra, of, of some of the, 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 the colleges from from back in 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 Norstwall, back in the capital city of Fellstall, where where magic is outlawed that, that cost you your sister because she was unable and you were unable to afford a charter for her to be recorded because magic in the capital city of Fellstall is outlawed, which is strange because you distinctly remember there being colleges where, where, where they taught the arcane arts. There, there were abbeys and monasteries there where they taught the divine arts. And you remember seeing magic just about on a daily basis, but almost all the people that used it were either gutter rat looking thieves and that sort of thing, or stately nobles, well off merchants and that sort of stuff. But this, this, this dwarven figure looks like something you would see hanging out by one of the, the, the more, as you would put it, normal colleges. Um, he looks educated, although you kind of question maybe how educated he is to be lost in this place. His friend, however, looks... The only thing you get off of this, this winged figure is this welcoming kind of air. If everybody would actually give me more solid, detailed descriptions, we're going to start with Sirith and go around from Sirith to Leandra to Thulrig, then ending with the impressive Uriel. So, obviously, my character is female. Yeah, I mean, you guys heard the voices. You can tell from overall that she is female. Um, she doesn't look that much older than the, the gal sitting next to her. Um, but she is a lot more stocky. She's she's pretty thick. You can tell that she's worked hard. She's got some muscle to her. Um, she's not like super tall. She's above average height. Um, her skin color, if you can see it because of the torchlight, um, it's almost not quite a sunburnt red. Um, almost like she's got fair skin, but was out in the sun too long. Um, her hair is reddish brown with little bits of, uh, gold highlights. Um, it's actually red with, um, gold highlights and it's kept short. It's like maybe very short spiky. Um, her eyes though are a reddish brown that right now are a little more on the, the red side cause she's a little freaked out and scared. <laughs> um, she tends to wear quite a quite a bit of range of red clothing just to make it distract, hopefully distract from her skin color being that bright. Did you describe the spider web like black scars? No, because I haven't gotten those written down from when that okay. happened. Go ahead and, and throw those into your description. Um, so it's I can't um can't remember if we said it was only going down one side or if it was... It's, it's actually kind of coming up both sides. And at first it looks like a, a dark shadow coming out from underneath of her clothing. And then it forms into like fingers, like spiderweb type fingers that kind of like almost like shattered glass up both sides of her cheeks to just where the cheekbones are at and peels back. Those right now are... are you can see the outlines of these black feathered lines but there's a very very traceable faint line deeper in that has got this kind of reddish excited fiery glow that is just now beginning to calm down so let's go with Leandra uh, Leandra is a very small petite 
little half elf. Um, she's only, uh, let me double check right here what I put. Do, 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 do. Um, she's only about like five foot three, very slight, um, very fair skinned, blonde hair, um, blue eyes, very young, uh, 20 years old, and she's a half elf. She's just got, uh, she's got some studded leather armor <clears throat> and uh, with a, some kind of traveling cloak hood that always has a, a hood. She doesn't always have the hood up, but she, frequently. And her look is very deceptive, because, and she will play that off. Um, but she's very smart. She's, you know, well, not very smart. <laughs> she's, she's, she's lived uh, in this she's been kind of on the run so she's she knows how to you know get around and use her wiles and she's not above you know using her looks to get what she needs if she has to but but she looks very sweet and very innocent and goner all right now that you guys are a lot closer you can tell like i said before where it was like a white it's a very very bright like platinum blonde almost clear hair um like especially his beard, uh, his braids, some of them look almost like icicles. <clears throat> They're so kind of light. Um, he has these like very crystal blue eyes, which is kind of in opposition to his skin, which is a darker tan. Um, you would expect very kind of light skin with this sort of coloring. Um, but so there's kind of this contrast of like a darker tan, uh, almost like a very weathered, outdoorsy, kind of you know years in the sun look to his skin and then like i said these very very bright crystal blue eyes and this very very light 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 platinum blonde hair um and as you kind of look you do realize that he does have a very academic look uh there's like some ink smudges on his face where he's obviously like was working on something and touched his mouth or his cheek or something his fingers you can see as he's holding the torch have ink stains on them uh, as you look at like his belt and stuff you see what looks to be maybe uh like a pouch for quills or something and some ink wells definitely has that scholarly look to him and then at the same time kind of has that same juxtaposition of he's wearing scale mail and he's got a bow over his shoulder and he's got two short swords on his side and so you're not quite sure where he falls uh kind of on that as it's kind of very much both sides of this coin of academic and warrior um he's a little maybe slightly above average height for a dwarf um but nothing you know crazy i mean maybe an inch or two uh i said the most striking thing you would catch from is probably the hair um uh, as it's a very odd coloration for a dwarf And Uriel. So uh, I actually wrote a little something up for my appearance here. So I'll go ahead and sort of read off what I had wrote here. Okay. Uh, it says, if one were well versed in the common tongue and were to search their vernacular for a word to describe Uriel, they might have come upon the word comeliness, which means the quality of being good looking or attractive. Uh, more than that, however, there's an air of silent calm and aloofness about him as if a single look piques one's curiosity. Um, he's tall with a slight but not thin frame, with long, straight blonde hair that falls well below his shoulders, piercing metallic silver eyes, and skin so white he is nearly luminous. Um, he's currently wearing um, his traveler's clothes, which, despite the fact that they're they're obviously well well used uh, due to having been stuck down here without a change of clothes for three to four weeks, um, they still he still has maintained them. Um, to the point where they're not terrible. Um, he's uh, wearing what looks to be a, a blue yeah. tunic, um, but he has no cloak or hood. Uh, he does not hide his face um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and he's wearing a, sort of a long, um, a long sleeve shirt, as it were, that buttons at the at the wrist, and then a pair of trousers as his traveling clothes. Um, he is carrying a couple of daggers, but they're they're not prominently displayed. They're within reach, but uh, 
definitely towards the backside of his attire so as to not present them in any way to anyone looking upon him. Um, and then haphazardly stuffed in his backpack as a, as a crossbow. Um, he also wears a, uh, a holy symbol, uh, if you will, of uh, his religion, which is, uh, is it Sarah? Sarah. Sarah, okay. And, uh, and a, in a sort of topaz colored crystal that he keeps around his neck at all times. As the four of you are gathered there on the cavern floor, you hear this great thundering hammering of these big giant meaty fists slamming to stone. And then it suddenly with a grunt stops replaced quickly by a dozen or more screeches, screams, eeks, and hollers in a very high-pitched, cacophonous, goblinoid chorus of such. As you realize that the goblins have attracted the attention of the ham-fisted, flabby giant that was trying to kill you, and you hear these great grinding, stone-thudding, cracking footfalls just echo out of the feast hall above, out of that room and into the darkness above you. And you almost, as a one, begin to release this sigh until you all, to a one, hear from the darkness you kind of, you kind of have Thulrig here with the four of you facing him. Thulrig's back to where Uriel and Thulrig first came in. You hear from the darkness. Much, much closer. But that in and of itself isn't quite is enough to, to, to rattle you, but you do hear a response coming from behind Thorig. <laughs> kind of a wet, guttural grumbling, not quite a growl, but definitely a grumbling sound. Can so I tell us not dead? We should get out of here. As a, as a matter of mechanics, can I tell, is this a language they're speaking? I speak deep speech. No, it's not. It's definitely not a language. It's just this kind of rumbly, kind of guttural, almost angsty kind of, 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 of sound, but definitely not, 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 a, not a language. Okay. Not a language at all. Thorig, I found friends. They were floating. Did you see that? It was amazing. Yes, I saw that. Keep your voice down. We should move. Oh, yes, yes. Start heading off. Same direction we were going before. So you're going to continue into the cavern off into that direction? Okay. As you... Is that like the only way? Is that the only like... Well, there's there's the water, like where you guys are standing, there's the water. There's the direction that, that, that you guys are looking, which is the direction that Thulrig and Uriel initially entered and then there is behind you which is as Thulrig pushes past and, and begins traipsing off kind of in that direction are the, the rest of you going to follow the the, the fleet footed fast moving dwarf Thulrig you're being rude we haven't voice. even introduced ourselves I'm Thulrig we're lost bad stuff up there bad stuff behind us bad stuff in front we should move. And I'm Uriel. Howdy. We should move. <laughs> I Your kind of agree with the move? door. <laughs> Her name's Man, Sarah. My name's Sarah. Can Please we go Please excuse now? my friend. He's not the smartest tool in the shed. Let, let's run because we do not want to see that thing that's up there. You just don't. <laughs> it sounds big. Very big is an understatement, and I think it just ate like nine goblins, so we better run. Well, that's good. You, I'm hungry, too. As you guys begin to move, the conversation <laughs> following with, 
You begin to hear more of these kind of moans breaking loose in the darkness, kind of in, in, in several different directions. And the way they echo out from this great giant cavern, it, it's hard to track exactly where they're coming from. But you, Thulrig, as you're, you're kind of trouncing through, you come to a point where there, the earth kind of splits. You see in the light a, a bit of a sheen, which could be indicating water. And, and your pathway continues in front of you and then also veers off to your left. You know, I gotta check something. I go left. Okay, Sirith, roll me a perception check. No, 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 no. Arcana. I think that fits I better. know magic. That would be a three. No. <laughs> that, no, that, 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 that's, per <laughs> that's perfectly fine. You all yeah. see Thorig leading the way. There's two paths you can go, straight or off to the left. And without announcing a change in direction, Thorig veers quickly off to the left path. Thorig, you take two or three steps, and you begin going from, from, from on this rocky, kind of disheveled, ill-footed ground, this earth, to what appears to be stone. As you guys come out onto this, you, Leandra, and Sirith both notice... That you've been in a position very similar to this, where up above, when you first came into the mines, you were actually walking across stone that was somehow built up to walk across the water itself. Um, as you continue forward, you come into an area of ruins. When you step forward, you can see broken, ruined, jagged walls. But what's kind of odd is you can actually see earth on the outside. As if you're walking through an area that was at one point in time held within the mountain itself. And there were, there were hallways and chambers carved out of it. And as that, over the centuries, when it collapsed and over the centuries has fallen down into this inky black water around you, you can see mounds. All that appears to be left... Are, are, are some of the corridors and now what's in front of you what appears to be this this great chamber as you enter into the chamber you you, you kind of are, are startled just a bit everybody roll me a perception check again these 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 guttural wet sounding <laughs> are kind of echoing through the chamber moving around I got a two Sirith. 11. Thorig. 20. Leandra. 14. 14. So, Sirith, Leandra, and Thorig, you both, your breath kind of catches in your voice as if you're, 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 you're walking through, the, through your, your dark apartment or home and somebody jumps out at you. You kind of get <gasps> like that because the room that you enter into right as you come through... What you can only have fixed to be a, an, an archway, a doorway, sometime deep in the fogs of history and time, right to your very right-hand side and right to your very left-hand side are these crumbled giants. At first, you see like the legs, the feet, the, 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 the size of them. They're maybe six and a half, seven feet tall, but the way they're carved... Uh, Thorig, you can immediately pick up on the fact that they are dwarven make and dwarves. But at first, with all the moaning going around, your senses kind of on edge. They startle you a bit as you kind of come into this this room, and you can see points. The room maybe 75, 80 feet wide, disappearing into the darkness. You can see where there's crumbled walls. Um, not necessarily corridors leading off. You can see where there's mounds of dirt that have traipsed away, chunks of stone. You, you come across the point where you actually have to begin picking your way through 
this rubble and stuff like that. Points where you can see liquid and water underneath. In the distance, you can hear this waterfall cascading down, splashing into the water. When all of a sudden, Sirith, you stop dead cold. Your vision, just this, this, this great glowing light appears in the darkness in front of you. It emanates out this radiance. It's the same image, this time much closer, that you saw of the, of the statues by this glowing, golden, lit-up, radiant archway. You can see some of the broken statue pieces throughout this crumbled, what was once a, a chamber of some kind. It's the same style of, 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 of craftsmanship, but those do not look like they've suffered the ravages of time or any kind of, of uh, uh, decay. Decay. As Sirith stops, Leandra, you're behind her, and Uriel, you're bringing up the, the rear, and you pull yourselves to a stop. But Thulrig, you feel this great unseen weight kind of come slamming and then pressing you down. It bears down on you. Nothing physical. You cast a glance to each side as you feel this need to, to bow forward. Your dwarven blood begins to, to boil with a passion you've never, ever experienced as this great deep voice fills your head. One comes through the fogs of time. You, little one, have walked upon a path called out through your ancestors aeons ago when the great kings of the Iron Halls ruled these lands. You now walk in the halls of time. Your calling before you come forth, Frostbeard. Your destiny awaits, and you all see. Do you try to resist the pressure to pull you down, Thulric? No, not at all. You all see with this great heaving weight as Thulrig takes to a knee. Uriel, roll me an arcana. I rolled a natural 20. You, you, you are almost pushed back. You feel as if in this room, time itself has been rendered. A, a distant age slamming into this current age and mixed in it, you hear this shimmering song of immense arcane energies and powers kind of tinkling off of the walls in the darkness, that waterfall sound taking on the sound of the most deft of barred fingers plinking the strings of an immaculately crafted leer. You, Uriel, nobody else. You're, this, this fog washes over your eyes. And almost like a cloud parting around you, you see kind of this milky edging, kind of roiling like a cloud, and appearing in almost like a mural in front of you. You see this great glittering dwarven hall. You can look out upon it and see hundreds, if not thousands, of dwarves moving about their daily business. 
You can see veins of great silvery metal in the walls. The sight almost brings a tear to your eye because you're looking upon something that you can immediately recognize just by the craftsmanship as being long lost. Roll me a history. I gotta run away for just a second. All right. Uh, 15 uh, minus one, so 14. Good enough. Crawling up out of the depths of the knowledge in your head, all you hear is is this old Professor Wranglin from back at the university. You hear him talking, standing upon his pedestal like apparatus, looking out over the class of a hundred or more students giving this great, god-awful, boring lecture about some long-lost dwarven kingdom that, that, that he presented as being nothing but spooky legend that, that, that fanciful-hearted dwarves hold on to. And this sword rolls off of his old, dusty lips. Iron Hall. And that, as it comes into your mind, the word silently, just barely audible, maybe slips through your lips as this image closes in front of you. As it sinks down, you see... On one side and then the other, ten of these black, armored, glorious-looking, brave, hardy dwarves. You can see in your mind that this has got to be some kind of sworn blood god to a great and ancient dwarven king. And then you see him standing maybe six inches taller than the rest, wide, broad shoulders with these great pauldrons, dragons off of each side, glittering iron blackened metal armor, great roiling braided beard of flaming red curls and the deep wisdom eyes, a crown set black iron, Glittering with a thousand jewels set upon his head. Walking in the center as it closes. It's almost to all of you like something just sucked the wind and the air out of this great enormous chasm. As, as you kind of maybe even hear a bit of a gasp out of Uriel, you see Thulrig under this weight as the weight is lifted, kind of gasp and, and, and kind of tumble forward a little bit. And Sirith left there with this odd look upon her face. No sound. You, Leandra, kind of look around, like feeling a bit left out of whatever the hell just happened. You didn't sense anything. <laughs> all this stuff, <gasps> gasps, and all this happening, and and you're just like, you you're you're focusing on these god awful moans erupting out of the cavern, out of this great cavernous space, while everybody here is all of a sudden putting on some kind of theatric show for some unseen hand. Sirith, that light fades, but something tells you it is right just a few hundred yards in front of you. As your eyes clear, Uriel, you're standing there. Thulrig, you write yourself and come back up. The floor is yours. I think we're going in the right direction. I spin around and I kind of run back over to Uriel and I wrap him in a bear hug and like, oh! I, I, Uriel Uriel's also very surprised and like takes a hold of, of Thorug as well, you know, just like squeezing him as hard as he can and just in return because he's giving him a hug and this is the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> he's super happy about it. The Iron Halls. You saw them too? They, you saw them? Rumor. 
These are the fucking iron halls. They're there. Oh my they're, god. We, just, we gotta go find them, right? What I mean, the they're, hell? They're, they're not here, here, but they're there, oh, here. This is the iron halls. This Wait, is what? What like legendary about? kingdom that dwarves oh. are raised oh. and told about. That's right. We're there. I never honestly believed that they were real. So, so that that you, uh, you did you take the professor, and he spoke about them, and it was like blah blah blah, and then he was like Iron Hall. Yeah, the super interesting lectures. Yes. Right. It's, it's not, <laughs> but yes. So those lectures, <laughs> Iron Hall. This is them. I saw like an amazing thing just now. It was amazing. Like there were dwarves everywhere. What are you talking What's about? I didn't see anything. Hold, friend. Okay, so no, seriously, we're just, just, <laughs> this is amazing. I, I, and I walk away and I go look at the statue, see if there's plaques or anything. I, I'm, Are you going to say anything, Sirith? I, I, I tried to, but I, apparently they were swept up in, in their excitement. Um, If you guys keep going this way and I'll point the way that I need to you'll probably find even more what do you see hard to describe more of a sensation let's go hmm. give me give me five minutes five minutes and I'm gonna start rummaging my bag and pull out some parchment and my inkwell and quill and stuff uh, like I, I want to look at these, you know, crumbled down statues, see if there's any sort of plaques detailing what they are about, see if I can find any information. While he's while he's doing that, I'm going to I'm going to walk over to the other two. He's going to be a minute. He's done this like seven, eight, ten times since we've been down here. And so it's been, just tell me about you while we wait. Go ahead and roll me an investigation, Thorig. That's going to be <coughs> 18. 18. All right. You begin to go through through this room, statue by statue, silently looking for any traces. Uriel stands there having asked you to tell him about you. So, Sirith and Leandra, what tales are you going to tell Uriel to regale him? What tales are you going to regale him with? Leanna just kind of rolls her eyes. <laughs> She's like, I don't know what's going on here. Okay. Um, so I started out as a bounty hunter. I, I travel around a lot looking for bad guys, taking them down. I was actually here working a job with somebody else. Um, met up with Lee. And ended up in the sewers of a town and in the process of trying to find the bad guys through the sewers, found the bad guys, killed the bad guys. But then everything went nuts. The, the entire town seemed to be just collapsing into the sewers. And so we ran and we ran some more and we ended up here. And the dragon. There was a the dragon? dragon that. Oh, was that, wait, wait, the dragon, what you saw the dragon? Was yes, it big? The dragon. Was it like huge? It was quite large. Oh, that would have been fantastic to see. It scary, was... I imagine, though. Over Probably my shoulder, I'm going to shout, there hasn't been a dragon in the area in centuries. You nope, must have seen something else. An I'll hour ago. My... <laughs> Full rig, don't be rude. They're telling a story. Please go on. A fable. Don't mind him. You don't he's know just, me well enough to grumpy. call me a liar. And if you want help down here, you might not want to. I think you made her angry, Thulrig. And you'll see kind of like little flamage of red start floating in her eyes. She's pretty scary. <sighs> Don't, don't mind him. Up. He's just, he's got bad manners. Uh, you know, he's probably hungry. And, and now he's, he's doing all the boring writing and, 
and scribing and all that other stuff, he's just going to be in a foul mood for a couple minutes, and then he'll go back to being in a less foul mood. Well, I'm in a great mood right now. You can probably see me walking around with this giant-ass grin on my face, kind of giggling to myself. Like I said, foul mood. All right. Thorig, as, as you begin to, to, to go through, the plaques that you find are one uh, at the bottom. They're kind of broken, but you're able to paste this one back together. At the feet of this great old dwarven statue, you find the name Gregan Blackfist. And a little bit stirs in the back of your mind. Another one, Tulmar Ironbeard. And that feeling begins to, to, to rumble a little bit harder in the back of your mind. Mandarin Goblin Splitter. The rest of the statues kind of sit forlorn, no plaques, until you come across one final plaque, or what you think is a final plaque. And that is of Gimeon Ridge Flyer. Again, it kind of goes up and then you come to the feet of a great seeded giant dwarf something about it kind of harkens deep to your heart a song raises up from the depths of your soul stretching back along the river of your lineage carved in thick Angular Dwarven Runes is the name Rill Hammerbeard. <laughs> Since the earliest wars with the goblins of Kregershan back in the days of the first king Ragnar Flamering, dwarves had faced many injustices, both real and imagined, if one were to be honest. In such situations, dwarves often would call upon real Hammerbeard, or as he is often called, real the Stout-Armed. For his hammer never has tired. Real is the dwarven god of vengeance and duty, and is the first dwarf of the Cadogan Fists, an ancient order of dwarven brothers sworn to seek out righteous vengeance upon any who would wrong the 13 dwarven clans. It is not known if the order still survives, as the Book of the Fist, which is held within the libraries of the Iron Abbey of the Forge Halls of the Iron Kingdom. <laughs> this history you know from study that you've been lost in for a long time, Thorig, stretches back 3,350 years ago. Sitting there on the ground in all of this rubble is a black iron amulet. You reach down to dust it away and tears fill your eyes. It is the symbol of real hammer beard, a black fist with a hammer rising behind it. This is the place where your ancestors began on a throne, rising up from the dwarven gods of Gadrin the Forge Father. Arden Black Shield, Gunderup Foax, Gritta the Stone Tender, and many more that are lost in time. This is the birthplace of dwarven kind in Aethon. Long thought to be a myth, lost in the deep dark shadows of time. This is the heart of the Iron Kingdom. To you, Dwarves are now relegated mostly to the Thane lands of Angbar, which are to the north and west. That is now the home of the 13 clans. That's where they've been pushed. This is the rightful home, lost forever. And then you see something, and you, you gasp, because out of the corner of your eye, 
You see something you would have never thought to see. You see a stone statue carved out of the most immaculate black and gold striated marble you have ever seen. It's fractured, it's broken. And you three see Thorig begin to assemble this thing. And when you see him assembling it, it begins to take an odd shape. And the story of Gimeon Ridge Flyer comes to your mind, Thulrig. He was the dwarf, the member of Cadigan's Fists, that discovered the magic, the energy, and a way of harnessing it and was known to have crafted 3,000 years ago, lost in history, the technology of dwarven airships. Roll me a history. <laughs> Connor, you better figure this out, guys. Oh, minute. God. I, I need not just 20. Anybody want to give me, like, a reroll or anything? Yeah. <laughs> I give you all the good vibes for good. This mean eighteen. Crawling up from the recesses of your mind, locked in some musty, dusty, like college library, like the section that's behind the section that's behind the section behind the forbidden section. Mm -hmm. You recall this book that in this book are some scattered tales about this great dwarven kingdom, the, the, the place where dwarves came crawling up from the fires of the Forge Mothers. Of, of Gimeon Ridge Flyer and, and the crafting of these, these, these airships, and there's a tale in there that claims that somewhere lost in the halls of the iron halls within the kingdom of iron sits and rest perfectly safe inside of a chamber locked is Ridge Flyer's very own airship. I would like to thank everybody for tuning in today. We will pick this up next Sunday for episode five of Adventure Weekly, with these wonderful players, Jens playing Leandra Nightfall, Mad Clergy jumping into the middle of the campaign playing Uriel the Sorcerer, Jeannie playing Sirith Thran, who for some reason seems to be tied into this whole thing, and Connor, the player of Thulrig Frostbeard, our dwarven ranger, and apparently a chosen one. I'd like to thank the players first. Then I would like to thank all of you who came to hang out with us. We super appreciate it. This has been Forged at the Table. This has been Adventure Weekly. Let's go around the horn, starting with... Sirith Thran, is there anything you'd like to part with? Airships. I want an airship. <laughs> Connor, make Dibs. your character figure it out. Dibs. Leandra, Dibs. Nightfall, Dibs. Jens, anything you'd like to say? Wow, well, poor Leandra didn't know what's really going on because she didn't get to see any of the visions. But if he just found an airship, she's like totally okay with that. <laughs> Thulrig Frostbeard, Connor. Uh, he's having an orgasm right now. Uh, it's probably going to go on for a while is what I'm getting from where I'm at and the names I'm hearing. All of these names I have heard before in previous campaigns, uh, and I'm just super, super, super fucking excited to see where this is going to go. Same Dwarven Master just... Race. And <laughs> from our newest player, Mad Clergy, player of Uriel the Sorcerer. I, I could fly. I don't know why everybody's so giddy about an airship. I don't... <laughs> because it means the rest of us can fly without wings. Oh. Also, airship and dibs. Oh, okay. 
I, I get my finger for Sean. Did you just want the airship now? <laughs> I, I am now going to do something I've been thinking about doing, and I'm going to give out the golden D20 of Radiance. This grants for the next session inspiration to start to one player that really captured my mind during this whole thing. And I'm had I had a hard time figuring out who I was gonna give this to, so I'm going to give it to both Uriel and Thulrig for the magnificent role playing and bringing your oh, character nice. to life. I appreciate nice. it. Thank you very much. It doesn't mean that, that the other two players did a horrible job. It's just that those two really captured my imagination tonight. And this isn't going to be given out probably every time, just once in a while. So for everybody that's watching, this has been Forge at the Table. Everything about our channels down below. I would like to point out that Jens and Mad Clergy are subscribers. All The only game that we have that does not involve you, our followers, and our subscribers is the Saturday game, The Long Road, which will be back next week. If you want to get involved, well. you want to come join us in playing some of these great games. We have some Call of Cthulhu coming up. We have some Star Wars from FFG coming up. We have some BTVS coming up, something I have promised for a long time. If you don't know what that is, that is Joss Whedon's creation, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yep. I'm going to be running some of that in the future. Um, oh, we've I'm got, in on that. We've got a ton of games coming your way. We've got a ton of DMs, or at least a couple hundred pounds of DMs coming your way. We want you guys to come join us. It's real simple. Look below. Throw a follow down on our channel. Jump on our Discord. Jump on our Twitter. Let us know you guys want to come over here and, and, and get involved. It's that simple. We need you to make this run. I would like to give a shout out once again to MMO Maniac for dropping that follow on us 19 hours ago when we were offline. Super cool. Weezits for the follow during the stream. Welcome to our family. A Zangoose. For the 1,300 bits during the show, super appreciate it. That is actually, those bits are going to be going to securing me a copy of the Magic Shop book for Buffy the Vampire Slayer RPG. To Grumble Skin, thank you so much for kicking off our bid to go to TwitchCon this year. Let me talk about that for just a second, if you don't mind. The reason why we are doing this, I have it on good authority that this year's TwitchCon is going to be super, super heavy on the D&D &D front. That's where we um, began. That's what is always going to be the more or less focus of this channel. 50% of this channel will always be on D&D &D 5th edition. We want to go in order to do nothing more than get word out, not only about this channel and all of that, but about all you wonderful people and what we as a community are doing here. This isn't just about me. This isn't just about this channel. This is about all of us as role players coming together and getting our fix on. That's what that is. If we don't reach that marker, I will turn it back into the channel in some way that will blow people's minds, but hopefully we can get there. Hopefully we can get to TwitchCon so we can spread the love. Again, this has been Forge at the Table. Hey, let's play some games. Peace. <laughs>